Okay, yeah, good. Uh, All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Trolling Water Logic on the 12th of March 2016. Just to let everyone know we're a live call in show. You can call in at any time. Just add the Skype contact Trolling Water Logic. We'll add you in due time. Like I can say, don't call us. We'll add you to the call when we're ready. And just quickly go around to the panel for tonight. Pumpkin, what's happening? Um, I'm just in from work and working my way to full blown alcoholism again. <laughs> uh, Kitch, what's happening? Not too bad, just settling down here. How's uh, everybody? I'm doing grand. Uh, Marty, what's up? Oh, I'm doing okay. And so finally, Nathan, what's happening with you? Well, it's my weekend, so I'm happy about that. All right, and so I suppose uh, just and another thing, because I know for the guest we have tonight, we might have some people with some quite strong opinion. If you do call in, please call in in the spirit of discussion. If you call in and you do talk to people at us, we will kick you off. So we just we do want to have a good conversation. If you're on the other side of the debate, we really do want to hear from you, and we welcome your calls. But anyway, with that said, uh, Nathan, you can introduce our guest tonight. All right. Well, our guest today is Vance Crow. He's the Monsanto's Director of Millennial Engagement in St. Louis, Missouri. He holds an undergraduate degree in communications from Marquette University and a master's degree from the Seton Hall School of Diplomacy, where he studied cross-cultural negotiations. Uh, before starting his current job with Monsanto in June 2014, he worked in Kenya as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer and as a communications coordinator for the National Public Radio affiliate station in California. And on today's show, he's joining us to discuss the challenges in effectively communicating what Monsanto is really about to the general public and how he has met some of those challenges. So welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, and Nathan, you can kick off with the introductory questions to get us started. All right, well, I'm sure you've probably heard this question on every other interview you've done before. But just to uh, kick us off, what does a director of millennial engagement do? <laughs> you know, um, aside from having the most awkward job title, certainly at the company, um, I uh, my job... So a few years ago, Monsanto realized that they were just talking to their farmer customers and their shareholder investors, and that all of the people in between those two poles were not people that they focused on reaching out to. And that actually means that there were millions and really billions of consumers that eat food grown from seeds that we sell that we weren't actually reaching out to and talking to because we weren't selling anything to them. And, and uh, what happened was the company started to finally take stock that uh, even though we weren't participating in the conversations with the general public, the general public is having a lot of conversations about Monsanto and about modern ag. And so they reorganized and they said, um, we're gonna create um, outreach efforts. We're gonna try and reach out to people that have strong feelings um, or have never even heard of us and try and go talk with regular consumers. And they did all of the things that a regular corporation would, you would probably think to do. So they uh, set up a digital team that does more outreach online. They um, uh, hired a PR firm to help them figure out what are the questions that people are, are really struggling with? How should we go out and present this? But then they also did something a little bit different, which was um, pr bring on a, a group of people that our responsibility was to go out and find out where are new conversations about the future of food happening and how can we join those conversations in an authentic way. So when we think about millennial engagement, I'll, I think for the most part people think, well, that's the age of people, right? Wh whatever Wikipedia says, born between 1980 and 2000. But I don't actually care at all about how old people are. What I care about are there are certain points in society where new ideas start to diffuse into the rest of the world. That's where um, new ideas come out. That's where ideas that have been traditionally thought of start to be challenged. And my responsibility is to help a company like Monsanto that doesn't have a culture around going out and talking to consumers figure out who is it that we should be talking to, um, where are they, what do they want to talk about? And then really, when Monsanto shows up to talk, who should show up? So I know you guys interviewed uh, Fred Perlack a few months ago, uh, one of our uh, geneticists. But we also have all sorts of other people, farmers and um, 
investor relations and attorneys and, and um, all different kinds of scientists and entomologists. So the question is, like, where should we be going and who should we be bringing to show up? And that's my role, to try and help the company develop a culture to go out and talk with consumers. And uh, what's been your general, what's been the reaction to you when you go out and engage with the public? Has it been positive, negative, or somewhere in between? You know, my, my expectation was that it was that I was going to come out here and that people would be super angry or that they would um, they would jump right on me and I would have to be prepared to be defensive at all times. And actually, that's not really at all what happens. The joke I often make is that when I meet somebody, so say I'm at like a conference and you meet and you just start talking with somebody. You know how after a little bit you you suddenly realize like I don't remember this person's name, so you look down at their badge to see like what was their name again? Well, when people look down and see mine, they see the word Monsanto across the chest and they always take a like a little step backwards. And so you can tell that there's electricity there, right? And then they lean forward and they're they're usually like kind of look over their shoulder to the left and to the right and then they say I don't have a problem with Monsanto, but I have a friend that thinks this. And it's so like, it's almost never like a really upset or tense situation. It's almost always they've heard that people have strong feelings and they represent that. So uh, it's been much um, more about curiosity than I ever thought that it would be. I spend a lot more time with people saying, I think I know this thing, but why don't you tell me more about it? Um, sorry, I, th I, th I thought someone was going to come in there with another question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. I wasn't sure if you were going to go for a follow up, but I've got one which would be whenever you have these uh, interactions with people who do the whole step back and then lean forward and say, well, this is what my friend says, what's been the most. Um, Am I just the stupidest or funniest thing or any combination thereof? Um, gosh, uh, you know, there's always the one where, where people's fundamental knowledge of genetic engineering is really low, but they, they think that, you know, you've been able to splice in, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the funniest, um, Gosh, I, I mean, I think the ones where they think that that we like, they think I represent. So a lot of times when I meet people, their understanding of who I am in the world is way bigger. Like I'm a giant to them because they perceive that I'm the director of millennial engagement for the company that owns all of the seeds in the world, which we don't have. You know, we have competitors. There are many people that run seed companies. If I go meet other seed companies, they view me as just like a regular guy. But I go out in the regular, if I go out in the rest of the world, I meet people that think you, you represent this gigantic monolith. And it's, that's always kind of uh, funny to me. You are the prophet of the seed god and we shall <laughs> worship you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, have you... Go ahead. Uh, so, so, sorry, sorry uh, you go ahead, Marty. Yeah, okay. Uh, the thing is, I, I keep uh, hearing all these things of, you know, Monsanto is the devil, basically. Uh, and why Monsanto? I mean, yeah, it, okay, so it's a, it's a big corporation, and uh, big corporations aren't known to be nice. I mean, it's about making money. If you don't have that mindset, you're not going to survive. Uh, in in the business world, I get that, but people seem to be under the impression that Monsanto is much worse than like uh, McDonald's, Coca Cola, Microsoft, uh, Google, whatever. I mean, what is is it just because Monsanto uh, develops food products and people are so afraid of you know what they're gonna they think they're being poisoned or stuff like that? So um, I think that that's a, that's a really good starting point. And actually, that's often the starting point that most people come to. Like, all right, I've, I'm meeting you. You're an actual person, which I had trouble imagining that Monsanto had actual people there. Yeah. And then they kind of come to the, but why do people feel so strongly about you? And I, I think that if we, go, if we go and ask people that were a part of the Greenpeace movement, people like Mark Linus or uh, Patrick Moore, 
what they'll often say is, if you're in the activist community and you want to block a technology, you don't want to make the message really complicated. What you want to do is make it very, very simple and pointed. So it's called a wedge issue. So by, yeah. by, by forcing, um, by getting everyone to um, always use the same terms and always point their anger at one company, then the public is, starts thinking, well, Monsanto must be this dark, evil place, and we should go out and create laws to block them. And what they don't realize is, if you create a law to block Monsanto, that law applies to all companies using that technology. And so it's a really effective strategy to keep everybody on target. And by making this really convoluted, uh, d dark conversation, such that you know we get to the, the point where even in this conversation, before we even start, you're like, hey guys, everybody be polite here. Because if you can level, if you can raise the, the anger of people to such a degree that they won't even listen in parts of a conversation, well, you don't have to go out and fight the rest of the companies doing this technology. You only have to target that one. And I, I think that's a, a big reason that M Monsanto has been used as a wedge issue. A question I would have would be, why is it that you think that uh, GMO foods are bearing the brunt of this assault? Because I've, I've been trying to play it over in my mind, like who benefits from there being no GMOs? And aside from a couple companies that make pesticides that are being made redundant, I can't think of that many. I think that's another like good foundational question, which is who benefits from blocking this technology? And I don't even necessarily think that it's um, pesticide companies that are being pushed aside because oftentimes those are chemical companies that will just switch what chemicals they're making. I think moreover, what you can do, and if you see where most of the rhetoric comes from, it's really not at the farmer level, not for the most part. For the most part, it's with the people that are selling alternatives to those products because what you can what you can do is if you say you know there's that famous xkcd uh comic where they say um i when marketers figured out that they could talk about what's free so like he has that cereal box two cereal boxes next to one another and this one says asbestos free and then they pay 20 percent more for it i mean i think in a lot of ways that's the non-gmo thing if you can make people afraid of gmos then you can charge a premium for not having them in your product, which means you didn't have to do any R&D, you didn't have to do any regulatory studies, you didn't have to do anything. All you had to do was create a differential between you and what the other things are. And the more fear and anger that you can crank in there, the more people will be willing to pay to have something that is without that thing that they're afraid of. I've always found that funny because the limited uh, interactions I've had with the anti-GMO people, one in particular that I was speaking before we actually came live. Um, it's a lot of stupidity in the idea that they're saying that, uh, well, it changes your DNA and it does all of these terrible, horrible things. And you ask for, like, where, where did you read that? I'm not asking for a peer-reviewed paper, just which glossy celeb magazine did you read that in? And the answer's always silence and then comment deleted but it's i it heard it on the internet therefore it's true <laughs> <laughs> yes um but it it always does sort of confuse me because from the little i understand of gmos it's you have a higher yield you have less waste and you have fewer pesticides three awesome things and yet the people who are talking about GMO free foods and it's homegrown organic goodness. What pesticides are you using? Oh, just this one that causes cancer. It, <laughs> it's something that's always stuck in my craw. So in this role, I've had to spend a lot of time trying to look for the, the ways that we have tried to explain genetic engineering or GMOs aren't working, right? We haven't been able to get them to proliferate. So I've, I spend a lot of time thinking about what are new ways that we should be helping farmers to learn how to talk about it or scientists. And a few months ago, I came across a talk by a guy that goes by Plintz on, um, on Twitter, P-L-I-N-T-Z, I think. 
and he studies machine learning at MIT. And while he was doing this, um, he was giving this amazing presentation on YouTube where what he talks about is how much, when, when you're studying machine learning, you have to know how is it that humans learn? What is it that we know? How do we know the things that we know? And one of the things that he's discovered is most of the things that humans know really are not, not knowledge at all. They're actually just turning to our tribe of people, the people that we trust, and saying, hey, I've heard about pesticides. How do we, I don't know what they are or how I should feel about them, so I'm gonna turn to the group of people that I trust on other things, then they're gonna give me an answer. We don't like pesticides, they're toxic. So when you come back and you give that opinion out to the public, now you are not defending this idea because it's scientifically based. What you're doing is you're now defending this idea based on what your tribe has said. And so I think oftentimes we go at the idea and say, no, you're wrong for this and this reason, but we don't realize that the person that's put forward that opinion, that sign of loyalty, is now going to be defensive of the people that have just told them that idea. And so in order to be able to get people to change what they know about things or their opinions, we often think, oh, evidence, we should slam into them from the other side. But actually, it's coming around to the side of them and saying, when you have a question, I can help you come up with a new answer. So that that way, it's not just the tribe that they turn around to that thinks all chemicals are, are bad or, or toxic. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of like it, 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 I'm sorry for interrupting, but but it, it's kind of like you, when you um, when you show the evidence, it doesn't matter how how well you explain it, the reaction is going to be, "Are you calling my grandpa a liar?" Yeah, and and sometimes I don't even think we realize uh, how much loyalty we have to our opinions, or that it's even just your yeah. grandfather. It could just be people that I go and listen to on the internet, that's yeah. what they think, and they, I trust them in these other things. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the problem. Pe people seem to, people associate, uh, or they, they put emotional value on um, ha having the same opinions as uh, other people. They, they must be right, because I have to agree with these people because the we're whole, on the same side. The whole, I agree with them on one thing, therefore I must agree with them on everything. Yeah. But that's human nature, right? Yeah, if, if you is. If you didn't have that kind of tribal mentality, you would have been ostracized. And I think yeah. it's really hard to get one person to move away from that opinion, unless they feel like they have a new community that they can join, yeah. they feel like they're, they're gonna be ostracized or they're gonna have to try and stand up to an idea and they don't have the knowledge or the deep background to be able to defend a difference of opinion. So it's easier just to stay there, which is why I think the skeptics movement in so many ways is a really powerful one because what you end up finding is you discover, oh wait, that's not the only way to think about something. And then you find there's a community out there that what they want to know is what does the evidence tell us? And it, it, to me, it's a big part of skepticism's success in the last five, 10 years has been that it offers not just new ways of looking at the world, but a community to join. Yeah. Sometimes it has a tendency to swing a bit too far the other way, but I do see where you're coming from the whole, nobody wants to be the guy sitting in the corner alone. Everyone wants to be able to talk with someone and have a conversation. But like you were saying earlier about uh, trying to simplify the message and saying like, hey, um, rather than slamming them with evidence saying, hey, if you have any questions, ask us. Do you find it, um, like I realize this is kind of a bit odd asking considering you're on a show answering questions, but do you ever find it somewhat awkward doing that, sitting back and, or sitting down with someone and answering the questions so that lots of people can understand? You know, at, at first, I approached this job as, as like, you know, very much that kind of thing I was just talking about, coming at it like this. But when you have a few experiences, like when you fly on an airplane and you are sitting next to a woman who, when she finds out you're from Monsanto, wants to tell you all about how she switched to an organic diet and how getting rid of pesticides and GMOs made her feel so much better. And then you keep talking with her and you find out, like, 
there are a lot of things that she had wrong in her life or things that she's scared of or guilt that she's feeling about not being able to buy those the all of that produce for her family or and so when you have a few experiences where you take a person and you can get them to let go of that fear and that kind of guilt it all of a sudden makes it like every conversation particularly with people that are the most angry or the most uh, afraid it's like a liberating experience. I don't know that at any other time in my life I've ever had so much, um, so many conversations that end with people being happy because they aren't as afraid as they were just 30 minutes before that. And that to me is an incredibly fulfilling, uh, you know, career uh, benefit, I guess. Yeah, um, I just want to ask, how do you combat some of the people? And we've had this quite a lot since we announced that you were, you were going to be on the show that they just say, well, you're the PR guy, you're the kind of pretty face to it. Of course, you're going to say these good things. And of course, you're going to try and make feel people feel better. So why should we listen to you? They said, we've had that common thrown at us quite a lot this week. So how do you respond to that? Well, I can say that, you know, our generation or really the last few generations, because of agriculture and because of advances in technology, we all grew up being with the real knowledge that we could grow up to be anything that we wanted to be. And the the thing that I always say is I, I grew up being like, I want to be good. I want to do good. But I didn't really know um, what it was that I wanted to do or what it was that I could contribute. So I wandered around the world for quite some time trying to do good. So for example, I was on an ecotourism ship as a deckhand and I joined the Peace Corps and I went to work at an NPR station and the whole time I have been searching for what is it that I can do to make the world a better place and when I finally came across the challenge that Monsanto was facing I, I realized th this is an opportunity to go try and help figure out how to make people not afraid of their food and help them find science-based ways to help the environment. And people can question uh, my motives. I think they probably should uh, because I'm just a guy that showed up and I am clearly paid by Monsanto to help them figure out how to communicate with the public. But I would think that the, the biggest part of my job is actually not going out and talking too much to the public. This is a, a really great opportunity. But for the most part, I spend time with scientists and farmers trying to help teach them what is it that the public is afraid of and what is it that they are interested in farmers talking with them about? Or how can scientists take evidence and frame it in a way that the general public can understand? So most of my energy, and I think it's a really amazing investment by Monsanto, because they've said, help us go teach the people that the public wants to hear from, scientists and farmers, how to communicate more effectively. And so, you know, I'm willing to take that on the chin that people d doubt my motives. But, you know, th this is the work that I'm... I'm uh, most proud of that I've ever done in my entire life. I'm glad you pointed out that, um, well, ba basically, you didn't say it, but you implied it, uh, that scientists aren't really doing a good job of communicating with the public. And that's something that uh, I get a lot from, from you know, because of uh, my job as a science teacher, I'm so, sort of, uh, scientists kind of dump things on me to, to explain everything. But I'm not the authority figure. They're they're the ones who 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 people want to turn to, and they basically don't give a damn about explaining it to laymen because, well, they're, they're more interested in, in convincing other scientists. Um, so so it's it, it's, yeah. It, it, I'll tell you, I, you know, yeah. as I, I I hear what you're saying, and I think this is where. Um, Mike Adams and Vani Hari and those people have actually done, um, and it's taken a while, but a pretty big service because for a long time, the culture around science came from one of academia. Stay in your office or up in your ivory tower or in your lab, do the science and don't talk about it. And, and so you have this entire culture that's been built for generations around just do your work and let the evidence speak for itself. But I would say there is a new generation of scientists coming out and saying, I'm not just going to stay in there. I'm going to come out and I'm going to talk because 
look at the craziness that's going on when yeah. people are allowed to run wild and call into question vaccines or willing to call into exactly. question yeah. all kinds of so you know as much as this has been a pain point and those people have profited handsomely off of this they, they now have poked the bear one too many times and science <laughs> is is definitely reshaping and trying to get out there so i hope that you the burden isn't just on science teachers anymore oh well, yeah i mean i can speak because like i said i'm currently back at college doing an engineering course and one of the big parts when i went into you know, mechanical engineering we had been taught communication a lot and like when you think you know most people say why would you learn that in engineering but when you see like people think oh we're suppressing electric cars we're you know big oil suppressors it's kind of learning how do we how we communicate our ideas not just because we'll be communicating with the public and other engineers how to get these things out. It, it, I mean, it's of critical importance, and, and it's only going to get harder as technology becomes more complicated. And, I mean, the, the things that are, as the Internet of Things proliferates, so much of the stuff that will be in people's lives will look like magic to them. And without people capable of explaining the magic, it, it, it's, you can't expect the public to know. Have you ever thought of getting someone with a long white beard to put on a cloak and carry a staff and say, Behold, Monsanto! <laughs> <laughs> no, you are the first one to posit that. <laughs> if you do it, I would like the royalties. Uh, made okay. out. I'll give you my details later. Let me write later. that down here. <laughs> but, no, it, it's interesting seeing... That, uh, Excuse me, I have to I have to comment on something that's been mentioned in the chat. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Anase Skyrider, is, is that how it's supposed to be pronounced? Uh, whatever. Uh, he or she says, uh, I'm 16 years old, I'm not going to understand fuck about quantum mechanics. Well, congratulations, you already understand more than most people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, you've passed lesson number one. <laughs> that's the big thing with a lot In of humility about what you don't know and what you do know yeah it, it seems to be that the the more someone knows the more they admit they don't know whereas the more stubborn and for lack of a better term stupid a person is the more they're gonna say i know everything i know all there is to know because yeah. i've learned from every conversation i've had with a scientist an engineer, any kind of, uh, ah, any kind of real fact-based uh, learning, they will always say, oh, "I don't know everything." Right. Yeah, this is the thing about genetic engineering. Come... Also, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, when, when we, no, I was just going to say when it comes to quantum mechanics, that's that's the funny thing about it. Uh, I think it was Richard Feynman who said. That, uh, anyone who thinks they understand it definitely doesn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was him. So it, it, yeah. So if if you just accept that you don't understand it, uh, you've already come a long way. <laughs> you know, when when I first took this role, Monsanto um, really invested in in training me because I didn't come from either agriculture or um, any kind of biotechnology background. So. Fred, who you guys had on, I think back in August, yeah. was he was in the last year before he retired. And they basically um, put Fred and I um, together and we spent all kinds of time talking to uh, about the science behind things and how do we know and how does the scientific method work. And what I came to the realization was the hardest group of people in the world to present to are scientists because they are going you if you step out of the lines even one little inch they're going to call you on it which is excellent but the challenge that comes with that then is you have a culture of people that that to go out and talk with the public becomes really difficult whereas you have people that are willing to spread fear and misinformation what do they care if they get called out on it no big deal but if you, if you're representing the scientists they, they've spent a lifetime learning, don't ever say anything that you don't know to be precisely true and have the evidence to back it up. And so that's, I think, part of that science communication stuff we were talking about before that I think is changing. Yeah. I think this is the disconnect, is the, the focus on evidence and backing up your theories with hard data combined with uh, um, just good theory and not just saying uh, what sounds good or 
uh, what you want to be true. And I, I think that's where the disconnect is. And um, when it comes to genetically modified foods, there's that area. And then there's areas like quantum physics and uh, astrophysics and all the rest. And when it comes to GE, that's when it hits close to home. People are concerned about the food they're eating. And it's a huge, complicated uh, scientific topic uh, about something that people do every day and is directly related to their health and survival. And do you think that's where all this fear about GE is coming from? A combination of not understanding the science combined with uh, having it related to something that they do every day. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you were just using GE for genetic engineering and it, it kind of brought to my mind one of the, the things that you were now hearing people that were at the forefront of biotechnology admit that they made a mistake. And that was very early on when they were talking about doing transgenics or any type of genetic engineering, they were not using the term G GMO, genetically modified organism. The activists were, and the activists were going out because they figured out if you tell people that their food is a genetically modified organism, that creates fear. So the, the industry, and including academics, when they went out to talk about GMOs, they didn't write that way online. So while the activists were building out tens of thousands of links, putting up all sorts of images, that now when, when Google goes to say, what's the best answer about questions with GMOs, those have all of the, the attributes of really strongly um, validated information. So the GMO, the, the activist rhetoric is what shows up when people go to their computer to ask it questions. And we're just now, just in the last three, four, five years, starting to use the language that people are using when they go to their computer to ask it questions. And it's going to take a long time to outcompete all of the linked articles because they had, you know, a 10 year head start. Yeah. So people uh, disconnect immediately, do you think, when they hear GMO or GE? Like, that's the end of the conversation for a lot of people and uh, just misunderstanding of that term and uh, a fear of that term. And are you, is, is it, about trying to move away from that and uh, reframe it as something else that's more uh, palatable to people's ears? or So one of the most amazing things that I've seen, I, I was down at the Missouri Governor's Agriculture Conference, and what they did was in the morning they went to the grocery store and they found six people that were just at the grocery store and said, hey, would you want to come and be a part of a focus group? So they randomly selected people. And then they had them sit on the stage and they did a moderated discussion with them where they asked them questions about, do you want your chickens to be raised free range? Do you want your um, food to have no pesticides? Do you want GMOs? And it was so fascinating to watch people in real time respond to questions that they're being presented with. And the one with genetic modification, GMOs, if you ask them, do you want food with genetically modified organisms in it? They, every single one of them said no. But if you spent just two minutes saying, this is what we've done, and they would explain like the BT gene um, being placed into cotton. or And all of a sudden, those people now say, oh, the reason that you're doing a GMO is because a farmer's trying to solve a problem with insects. Now they don't have a problem with it, but it requires that two and a half minute intervention. Well, there's 330 million people in the world, or in not in the world, in the United States, and there are billions of people in the world. So it's just in order to be able to outcompete the uh, hurdle that you have to get over um, with uh, that that term, it's going to take a little bit of work. But I, I would say that. Um, we can't turn away from the term GMO. The trains left the station. That's the way people interpret it. And so we've got to embrace it and we've got to outcompete those networks um, in order for people to get better information when they ask Google what's the answer to that question. Well, to be fair, from what I understand of GMO, I've always sort of seen it as it's just fast tracking normal uh, crop rotations, or not crop rotations, um, 
It's just fast tracking cross pollinations. It's taking something from one plant, putting it in another, and it might not be something that would be readily available or even, I don't want to say possible because, you know, eventually everything could be possible, but you do something really difficult to solve a problem, to make more food, to make it taste a little bit nicer, or to make it that the insects don't want to eat it anymore, which it's, if a farmer could have done that with two plants, putting them side by side and making a third, they would do it. And it would, in my eyes, still be genetically modified. It's just a different name for the same thing. But I think you're kind of describing something that's really powerful, right? Like once you understand this, you not only um, does it make sense to you, but you're like, this is amazing. Look, look how far humanity has come that we're able to help a plant outcompete insects so that we don't have to spray a chemical on it, right? And I, not that I have a problem with chemicals, but I'm just saying we can help the plant build a better genome that makes it more resilient out when we're trying to plant it. People, when they, when they fully grasp that, start to feel this wonderful sensation about humanity if, 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 if it's given to them in a way that they can understand. Otherwise, if it's not given to them, if it's given to them with FUD in, involved, they, they, are, they feel that sense of dread. And that's why, I mean, getting scientists and getting farmers out there to help make sure that people understand why are they doing this makes all the difference in the world. So we're getting some people from the other side now in the chat room, which is what we really wanted. And one thing that did come up, and you probably answered this, is the whole Agent Orange thing. So what's, how do you address this one? You know, that's one that um, is really common. And, it, and I think the reason that it comes up all the time is because it makes people angry to think that a company would produce a chemical that would be so harmful to the environment and to people um, but I think that when you hear the whole story, it's a, it's a little bit different. So this is back in a time uh, when war was going on, and the U.S. government came to nine chemical companies and said, you must produce this chemical for us. This is the formulation that we want, and uh, we, we're going to take that and use it in our own you know, methods. We didn't have anything to do with the creation of Agent Orange. And we weren't having anything to do with the application or how it was being used, but it was a time of war. And so we produced the chemical that the government um, asked of us, and, uh, and it had consequences. But I think that the reason that Monsanto is the only company that people can name that produced Agent Orange is because it's one of those tools that activists have figured out. You can really drive anger around this company if you get people to believe that, that this company was knowingly and willfully trying to harm people in, in the way that um, Agent Orange is. Yeah, well, to be fair, every time I see the Volkswagen, I do think the Hitler mobile. <laughs> but I think it's not even that. It's like you said earlier about... Um, a law passed against Monsanto is a law against all GMO foods. The reason that people uh, see Agent Orange and Monsanto as linked is because Monsanto is just the biggest name. It's when people think of GMOs, they automatically think of Monsanto rather than realizing it's an entire field. Yeah. But it's a way to, of short circuiting to, to address... people's need for evidence. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say that when it comes to this whole Agent Orange thing, um, oh, okay, so you, you wouldn't another way to, to look at it be, okay, we did it. We did something bad. Own up to it. I mean, it... it so, I yes, mean, you can, I mean, you can come up with all these kinds of... Uh, uh, you know, attempts to justify it and say, well, it was war, the government, uh, you know, if we hadn't done it, someone else would have, blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, how does having done that thing in the past, I mean, for, first of all, you, you were not the ones deplo who deployed it. Uh, you know, do, do you blame the guy who makes the gun or do you blame the guy who pulls the trigger? Um, 
I, 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 I don't see really why people are, are blaming you for, the, for, for that stuff. I don't get it. So I, I guess what I would say on this, I mean, is even Fred, who had been with Monsanto for, you know, several decades, um, wasn't at Monsanto when that went on. But that never feels like a very satisfying answer to people, right? Because if you say, oh, well, you know, you have this corporation and they did things, we want someone to be held to account. We want somebody to say um, you were bad or did some incorrect things. And I think that this is how you use a topic like Agent Orange um, in order to be able to short circuit evidence that people have to, to, uh, on other things, right? Because you always see that argument stacked right against another reason why genetically engineered crops shouldn't be there or um, other modern ag techniques. I think it's also important to point out that literally we're not the same company. So we used to, Monsanto was a chemical company. It's had over a hundred year history. But we now have divested the, the, the chemical part, the part that we did with pharmaceuticals, and now we just focus on uh, technologies for farmers and, and are an entirely separate company from what that was. But when I say this, it's not a very satisfying answer to the general public who's been made to feel like we should be culpable for something. Right, guys, do you have any other questions there? Anyone hearing me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. Dramatic yep. silence. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm trying to read what, what the guys are, are writing in the in the chat room it's, here. Uh, uh, the, you just, the, you're just checking the shill checks are clearing in your banks yeah, right now. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> the anti Monsanto muted. guy is basically just saying uh, no one has any arguments and Vance is talking out of his ass, but he hasn't made any argument himself. I think. Um, um, so from what I heard, like I was trying to say it and was muted because I'm an idiot. Um, it sounds oh, we like know that. an issue with shut up, Marty, you fucking be an issue Norwegian bugger. <laughs> um, <laughs> the issue with uh, Agent Orange and Monsanto sounds more like an issue of branding. It's Monsanto did this and they did this all that time ago when they were a different company under different circumstances who were given a set of orders from the government that they were working within the boundaries of. It's. It does sound like you would need to either find a way to differentiate the companies and say we don't do that at all anymore, and make it a separate entity. It definitely sounds like an issue with branding. Well, they so when the company um, IPO'd, so we were bought up, and then we were spun out and then it's it's kind of got a complicated history particularly in the last 20 years the the question came down should we change our name and the company was so small because they had just taken the agriculture parts just the biotechnology parts and uh, that they said well it's going to cost us tens of millions of dollars to change the name monsanto and to go back into our records and change all of our contracts you know what it's going to be fine let's just keep with the name monsanto and, and try and move forward. And that's back when we were a brand new, very small company in the mid nineties. And now 20, 20 in the, you know, 2016, we have to deal with the fact that that name has a lot of branding uh, challenges attached to it, but it also has all kinds of, of great things attached to it. You know, Monsanto is one of the few companies that has a Nobel prize winner as one of our scientists, we have a monument um, in, in our on our campus about a scientist that helped work on, uh, I think, uh, discovered L-DOPA and, and worked with uh, Parkinson's patients. And th that's amazing, but you never hear activists talking about that. Uh, there was an important question came up there. They said, would you be willing to face off Mike Adams in a rap battle? <laughs> <laughs> No, man, have you heard that rap? I can't do that. That's amazing, right? How many views has that thing gotten at the... That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we'll carry on like some of the... Like you've seen some of the comments we got, so I think we could fight because there was good points being raised about it. And the other thing is the patenting of gene sequencing. That came up quite a bit as well. So can you explain Because people seem to think that Monsanto's the only one that does gene sequencing and they, they came up with it and this is your kind of 
you know, you're you're a number one weapon to go after people with. So I think that that's often split into several different complicated uh, areas. But maybe just to simplify, most seeds, well, I don't, I don't know about most. I can't even say that. Many seeds where you have a, a certain type of apple or a certain type of, of fruit, that has been um, branded. And, and once that seed, that the entire genome of that seed you can't just go start planting those seeds that you grab from fruit at the grocery store and start putting them in the ground, grow them up, and then start selling those seeds. Those are branded and copyrighted and, and owned in some way. And I think that people often feel like Monsanto is the only one out there using patents on their seed technology when it's just not true. Even universities that come out with new um, varieties of, of crops often have patents on them and are the only ones that can can um, benefit from their sale. Uh, but the other part is the lawsuits. And I think people um, have this sense that Monsanto is going out and suing thousands upon thousands of people um, <laughs> for cross-pollination. And it's actually just not true. It, it's, uh, it's one of those things that if you think about Monsanto as a business, if we go sue a farmer um, that is losing a customer probably forever because if you sue one of your customers, they're going to go find someone else uh, to sell them seeds. So we have only done it in the cases where there's been serious, egregious violations in the contracts that they've signed. And um, actually, the, the contracts that people sign are kind of an interesting story. If you think about something like um, when we came out with BT cotton for the first time, we knew that farmers could take those seeds plant them and then get the seeds next year and put them in the ground and grow them uh, the same way. And so what we had spent tens of millions of dollars developing those seeds, getting them all the way through regulatory. So if we were only going to be able to sell them one time, when we came to the, the cotton farmers, we said, okay, we have this new bag of seeds. This is going to be the most expensive bag of seeds anyone has ever purchased because we've got to get all of the R&D back from it in this one sale. And the farmers were like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We want continual better varieties year in and year out. So what if we come to some sort of agreement where you guys agree that you will not gouge us on prices year on year, but we will agree that if we grow your seeds out, we will not replant them the next year. And that made it so we could build a, a, a research and development pipeline that benefits farmers while not just giving away all of the research that we've done. The, the challenge to that is if you're going to make that agreement that a farmer isn't going to resell it, if one farmer's neighbor keeps their seeds, saves them and plants them again, well, then now that first farmer is at a disadvantage. So one of the things that they asked us to do is if you find cheaters, you have to pursue them, which is a difficult thing. But if you uh, look at the details, you know, we've only taken something like uh, only filed about 50 suits and only 12 of them have ever gone to actual trial. And out of those 12, only four have gone all the way to the end to adjudication um, because we don't want to sue our customers. We want to find ways to deal with the, the challenges of them reusing our seeds um, uh, in, in a way that doesn't involve lawsuits because that's tough. Does that answer the questions? Do you have any... Go ahead, Nathan. So uh, I was just wondering, do you have any insight on how this story about Monsanto suing farmers has grown so out of proportion with people just taking the story and running with it and turning it into something that it's not? Um, is it just a, an appealing story for their side to uh, take it and run with it and turn it into this huge overblown thing that's not actually true? Uh, because uh, I'm sure Monsanto is not the only biotech or agricultural company that has these patent laws in place. I mean, uh, food companies have been, farmers have been pat patenting seeds for hundreds of years, and only in the last couple decades have people um, taken taken issue with uh, pat patenting seeds and, they, and then framing it as, oh, they're uh, patenting life and uh, all these others, all these other things that don't make much scientific sense, but make a lot of emotional sense. And is is that emotional aspect of it the reason why uh, the story about 
the, the myth about Monsanto suing farmers has uh, become such an appealing talking point. Definitely. And, you know, it's just it's one of those really simplified arguments that gets people to be able to short circuit some of their other thinking about genetically engineered crops. But this is a narrative, in my belief, that's been driven. There was a, a canola farmer out in western Canada that claimed that cross pollination over his crops had made it so Monsanto sued him. But if you went and actually looked at the details of the story, there was no possible way that it was only trucks passing by him throwing pollen off that caused those um, seeds that he was growing to be GMO seeds that he did not pay for. But that was a documentary. That, so they took that case, even though they lost, and it went all the way up through the court system, and they lost, and there is loads of evidence that was put into a documentary framing it up as a, a vulnerable farmer being taken advantage of by this large corporation. And we already have this sense that corporations are mean and bullies, but that it kind of plays into what we already think. And then just this last summer, um, there was a, a video posted about a, a farmer down south that, that um, was, was trying to claim that his father had been wrongfully accused of, of planting seeds that he didn't have the right to. But it, there, the evidence is there that he was saving seeds, replanting them uh, outside of the contract. But if you make a documentary or a little mini documentary and you put it to music and you make it really emotional, people want to protect the little guy and the activists know that. So they keep plugging that narrative, which really detracts from are GMOs actually safe? Are the companies that are doing this looking out for their own customers? So it, it's one that seems to be easily drivable, but doesn't really help the conversation. I think I know the exact perfect way you could counterpoint that. Like you said, um, uh, people like to, you know, shit on the big companies and support the little guy. If you make a, a real short black and white video with some sad violin music and a little panda sitting there crying, it's like, Pandas need GMOs too. Don't be a dick. White beards and pandas. <laughs> and rap battles. That's what you. And rap battles. That's, that's what your, that's your rock schedule is going to be next. <laughs> so there's a question. Uh, I I think uh, someone didn't quite get what you were saying, and uh, it sounded like a good good question. Uh, Monsanto can sue people who grow GMO. Hmm. Is this the there. one in the chat, Marty? Yeah. Uh, ah, uh, I lost it. It scrolled right. away. Uh, damn it. Oh, it! Is it the one Cal posted in here? Hang on. Sorry. No, that's not it. Okay. Uh. Something about can uh, can can pe can Monsanto sue people who grow GMOs uh, GMO seeds that aren't from Monsanto? No, uh, I mean the, the so I don't maybe maybe I can try and guess or kind of grasp at what they're talking about. So when when we're talking about the lawsuits that that we've um, had to do just a few times over the years, we're talking about a really specific instance where. We have sold seeds to a farmer, and when we sold those seeds, they signed a contract saying that they would grow those seeds responsibly in accordance with the, the rules of, you know, there are a lot of regulations that talk about how do you make sure that you um, properly grow these crops and use them so that we don't develop resistance, but also that once those crops um, reach maturity and you harvest them, that you won't take the seeds and then replant them. And only a few times have farmers been found to be uh, taking some of their seeds, cleaning them, and either replanting them themselves or selling them to other people. And it's only in those egregious situations where we've had to bring, bring lawsuits up against farmers because they're violating a contract that they had signed uh, just a few months before when we sold them those seeds. Okay. Uh, yeah, Soulfire should come in with a question just as you're speaking them. Just why not replant them? Why, why not replant them? Yeah, that's uh, Soulfire just asking that in the chat room. So, for the most part, farmers don't 
save their own seeds, and they haven't since probably the early 1930s, particularly if you're talking about any seed that's a hybrid seed. So corn, for example, what you do is you take two parents that have been specially bred to when they have an offspring, that offspring is going to be really tall and, uh, well, not necessarily tall, but it's going to have features about it that are only going to happen that one generation after it. And if you go to plant that a second generation, it'd be like taking two labradoodles and, and having them breed together. You're not going to get a better labradoodle. You're going to get something different, something a little bit, they're called F2 crosses. They don't grow very effectively. So farmers never replant hybrids. But then the other ones, the seeds that are not hybrids, it's because we've come up with an agreement so that that way we can continue to uh, sell seeds every year uh, so that we have money that we can put back into our R&D and make better and better seeds to bring to farmers. I think we'll carry on just going through some of the comments we got this week because people were saying, I bet you won't ask him this and you won't ask him that. So, <laughs> but, so and the other thing someone was on about was you know, Santos high prices. They're saying that you're ex basically extortionist. So uh, what's your feedback to that? You know, um, uh, seed business is incredibly competitive. And if you go out to a farmer and you ask them about, you know, who do they buy their seeds from, farmers almost never buy just one from just one company. They buy from two, maybe three companies at any given time because they never want to give all of their business to one company. So what you end up having is incredibly competitive prices because a farmer can say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be able to plant 200 acres for you know significantly less because this guy's giving me a better deal. So when we talk about what the prices are that Monsanto charges farmers, if we aren't giving a competitive price, the, the competitors will come in and offer those farmers seeds that, that give them the traits that they want for a price that they're willing to pay. Oh. This one comes up about India. I think what the guy, um, he didn't like really it. allude to it's about in debt. It's, I think this is all the whole thing relating to the suicide rate in India. And they've tried to, another weird thing, they've tried to peg onto Monsanto. So... Uh, have you heard this one before? Yes. Do you want to ask it specifically or do you yeah, want me to... Yeah, I'm asking okay. it on behalf of the commenter who left the, these questions. So uh, the Indian farmer suicides is one that we can definitely see um, activists pushing that narrative. And that narrative is that somehow we are selling seeds to farmers and getting them in debt so and then their seeds don't grow and they're put into such a terrible position that they would they would choose to end their own lives rather than go on. And, um, you know, at the beginning of the show, we were talking about, um, you know, funny questions that people ask. This is the one that I have to struggle to not become angry or cynical about, because this is one where if somebody propagates that rumor, they are saying these 20,000 people that work for Monsanto they don't care uh, enough about people living around the globe uh, such that they would let this happen. I mean, it, it is absolutely an absurd uh, concept, but I, I know where the genesis of it came from. And that is that when we first entered the Indian market um, with uh, BT, we said, um, we're going we're gonna to charge a pretty high price for these uh, seeds and only a few farmers are going to be able to afford them. And so we were selling them just to a, a pretty small population. And some people came along and said, hey, wait a second. When you look at a cotton seed, you can't tell the difference between whether that is has a BT gene in it or not if you're just a regular farmer out in rural India. So if we can get the bags that say Monsanto on it, we can get people to buy expensively priced seeds that don't have any of the traits that are promised in that brand that they're buying. And so that's what they did. So what you had were counterfeit seeds being planted by people that were paying for, for, for um, out of the back of somebody's truck or in some side warehouse, and they put in, they planted seeds. And, and in India, 
this is subsistence farming. If you don't make your crop grow that year, if it is not successful, you really can get in very big trouble. And, and, and there aren't the safety nets that there are in the Western world where if a, a farmer has problems, they aren't going to lose everything. In India, they may lose everything. And those counterfeit seeds um, really put a lot of farmers in, in bad situations. But the good news in this is that two things happened after that. One, Monsanto got really serious about understanding how the counterfeit system works. And we became really diligent about how protective we were of things like the, the, the bags that we sold seeds in and that we used actual registered dealers that knew how to, to that. So a farmer, if they went to buy seeds from us, they could tell that this was a registered dealer that wasn't going to sell them counterfeit seeds. And then the second thing is, if you go look at the overall um, rate of farmers um, taking their own lives, th that number is actually getting better, which means a terrible situation where farmers were put in a position where debt caused them to make the, the, that terrible decision, um, th they are getting better. This is a declining problem that Monsanto was not contributing to, but we have seen and recognized that there are ways that we can help make sure that, that counterfeiters can't exacerbate that problem. Thank you very much for that, Vance. I think we'll go to the chat room questions now. So, you know, one of you, who shall I nominate? Uh, sure, um, I'll, uh, yeah, Kitch, you've spoken the least. It's always the, the person yeah. who speaks the least has to do chat room questions. So. Grand. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think I'll start with uh, Sean Hufford's question. If we buy a Monsanto GMO apple, then take the seeds from said apple and start growing them on our own pers for our own personal use, is that a patent issue? So if you are growing an apple, um, you did not buy that from Monsanto because we don't sell apple seeds. <laughs> 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 um, but I think that the core of the question is, if you buy a, an apple and, and start growing those seeds for your own consumption and you're not selling them out and you're not growing them out to then be put into a commodity, I mean, there are so many acres out being grown in the world. You know, we want people to abide by those contracts, but but um, but we we would have no way of detecting that if you're not selling them, if you're not going out and trying to um, produce off of those seeds. It, we would have no way of knowing that you were doing that. Pitch, carry on. Oh, sure. And this is from the get from a guest, uh, 413, blah, 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 blah. Uh, why not just make better seeds instead of forcing non replanting? So that, that's a good question. Um, and actually, we do, right? Uh, every year, there is some percentage yield bump. So um, let's say the first year you were getting. 100 bushels per acre, and I'm just making these numbers up, and the next year you get 102 bushels off the new better seeds that we put out, then 2% off of that, every year they're getting better. So if farmers did end up saving their own seeds and replanting them, they would fall behind by what their neighbors are getting. And, and that saving of seeds is just not a common practice among farmers in general. It's actually why uh, there are so few saved seed lawsuits because it's just really not profitable for a farmer to save their seeds. You know, one of the things that I didn't understand until I've been in this um, in the company for a little while, we, when we sell a bag of seeds, have a commitment for how many, what percentage of those seeds will germinate. And if they don't, if you don't germinate at that 90, I don't, I don't know the exact percentage, but it, it's pretty high then a farmer can get their money back. And so, um, but if you are saving your own seeds, you have no idea what that germination rate. You could put out 100 seeds and only 80 of them will germinate. That's a real problem for a farmer to only, to get a 20% reduction on how many of their seeds even grow crops at all. And um, actually, I just got my uh, question that I thought of uh, there when you were talking about the uh, situation in India. Do Monsanto do any um, kit that for farmers that if they suspect that they were given a counterfeit seed that they can use to determine if it that 
plant is producing the, let's say, BT, if the plant is producing the BT toxin, something that they could use, something really simple or... Oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, so the way that you detect for any sort of GMO is that, and we have to have the assays that say, if you chip that seed and you and you find the DNA in it, you say, does it have the marker that, that, that says that GMO is in there? So could it be done? I'm, I'm sure that it could scientifically, certainly it could be. But I think that the way that we got around it was that we really helped what was a very informal seed market become a more formalized market with registered dealers that, you know, wore mm -hmm. uniforms and had an office or had a way for you to be able to tell as a consumer, is this person a real person representing Monsanto, a seed company that I trust? And I think that's the way that we, we dealt with counterfeit. Okay. Sorry, Coach, I'll just butt in there because Soul Fire has been asking this question a few times and we've always been in sure. mid conversation when he's asked and he's, um, how, do you know how close they are to developing a blight-resistant potato? A blight-resistant potato. So Monsanto does not grow. Uh, we don't. We don't sell potato seeds, as far as I know. Um, uh, but certainly, um, anybody that is working in uh, seed development for potatoes or really any any crop are trying to breed blight resistance. So you don't necessarily have to solve all problems using GMOs. What you're looking for are, like, like we were talking about earlier, finding um, one particular variety of potato that has that blight resistance and figuring out how to breed it with the crop, with the, with the variety that has the qualities that you like. You don't have to do that as a GMO. You can just breed those plants together, using them as a mother and a father and crossing that pollination. And then, and then if you know what the actual uh, marker is inside the gene for blight resistance, then you, you're able to detect that and see, well, let's grow these seeds out that have that blight resistance. So um, absolutely, uh, every, every type of disease that is out there um, that is causing real problems to farmers, seed companies, whether they're Monsanto or somebody else, is definitely interested in trying to find ways to uh, grow seeds that are resistant to it. Because if you do, those are valuable seeds that farmers are willing to pay for. I'm suddenly very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a question, a, a very important question that I need you to take straight to the scientists. All right, I'm going to write this down, just like the white beard and the pandas. Oh, yeah, if you can make this, Monsanto is going to be a household name and this plant will be in everyone's living room. Could you make a plant that brews beer? <laughs> so um, I, I, I don't I don't I don't know all of the particulars and I don't want to predict the future because many things could change. But I don't know how that would be done. But I will say this. Um, have you guys ever heard of a program called iGEM, International Competition for Genetically Engineered Machines? No, never heard. So it's a competition of synthetic biologists, and it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with Monsanto, but it's young um, undergrad college kids coming together to try different types of genetic engineering, not just in plants, but in yeast and um, it, all sorts of, of different applications. And the reason I bring this up is uh, every year they come together in October uh, in Boston. And students come, come up with these amazing projects. So, for example, in Indonesia, there was a group of, of women from a, um, from a college in Indonesia that, that figured out that the test to, to determine if somebody has dengue fever cost like $40 and took five days to be able to determine that. And, um, and they figured out that they could engineer yeast um, so that you could apply blood to it and it would turn color, photofluorescent, if, if dengue was there. And the test cost about 50 cents and could be done in about 20 minutes. And the reason this is so interesting and relates all the way back to your beer question is synthetic biology is not just going into things like dengue fever. It's going into can you modify the flavors that yeast produce so that you could have beer that tastes like coffee or beer that tastes mm. like mint and you're doing it based on the expression of that yeast. And so the, the, I think the fascinating part of this is 
the, the, you know how earlier I was saying I go out and talk with scientists and farmers, those are the types of scientists that I try and spend time connecting with to say, look, the activists, when, um, when, they, when they start to see the edges that you're trying to push science, they're going to come after you and you need to know how to respond and how to connect with the public. Um, and things like beer could be a great way to get people to understand real benefits of genetic engineering in a way that crops really haven't because people don't know that farmers are facing problems with weeds and insects and blight. For the most part, those are really far away. So I'm excited about the synthetic biology movement and iGEM. Okay, you have literally no idea how happy you've just made me. <laughs> <laughs> the, team, the team that was doing that was in the UK, and the, the funniest thing was they were not allowed to drink their beer. So they, they, could, they, they could get the yeast to express, but because of the laws in the UK, yeah. they could only open up the beer and smell it, but they couldn't <laughs> drink it. I will buy them an island if it is possible. <laughs> if this is a true thing. Yeah, look it up. It's, it's iGEM. It's the, and that one was the London DIY biospace, which are really fantastic things, um, which are getting people that are just in the general public to have access to laboratories so that they can start um, feeling and touching this technology, which for a long time has really just been left to big labs or academia. Okay, Kitch, we just got some questions coming in there from Manny Skyrider, so can you ask them? Because that's, uh, if I believe, writer's mother is a farmer with some concerns about Monsanto, so that's the kind of people we want okay. to hear from tonight. Grant, so the first one is, um, so uh, I was asked in the chat, crops that produce their own poison. What is the concern about corn absorbing these poisons and you ingesting it, especially over a long period of time if you eat that food more regularly in your home? So if I'm understanding the question correct, it's, so take something like BT. How do we know that if we're eating this, this, uh, this crop that has an insecticide, in it that it's not going to harm us is that is that the way that question was i think that's what you said yeah uh, and it's correct us that is. we're wrong there uh, well just carry on vance uh. so so the interesting thing and and if you're really interested in this i if i recall correctly fred perlack's explanation of how the bt endotoxin works was really pretty incredible but the all plants every single tree that you see out there Every type of, of uh, green organism that you're looking out on in the world, insects would eat it if they could because they're trying to compete for calories in the same way that we are to be able to grab that energy. And so all plants have developed mechanisms to keep insects from eating them. Um, and so th those are in some ways an insecticide. Just the same way that BT prevents a, a plant from eating it. And, and if we think about BT, this, this is a bacteria that's found in the soil. And what, we, what has happened for a long time was that people would take that bacteria out, they would grow it in large vats, they would put those, um, the BT in a sprayer, they would fire up a big diesel engine, and they would drive a tractor back and forth back and forth all day long spraying this bt over top of the plants so that when the insect landed on it as long as that residue was there it would kill the insect we know through using scientific um, studies and a whole lot of evidence because we've been doing this for a long time that that bt hurts insects but has no impact on us it, it doesn't it doesn't harm the intestinal tract it doesn't bioaccumulate in human beings but once we figured out that we didn't have to spray it on the plant, we could actually give the plant the gene so that it could produce that toxin to the, to the insects. Then all of a sudden, you don't have to fire up that diesel engine and drive it up and down the fields, but we get the benefit of having an insecticide that doesn't impact humans. And all of the crops that we put out that are GMOs are so rigorously studied. It takes something like 13 years and $10 million per year in order to get through the regulatory process in the U.S. alone. Then when we go to sell it to other countries, these seeds, or to import, we have to pass their regulatory standards too. So GM crops are so well regulated by all of these um, 
agencies that we have to have a lot of evidence that they are going to be safe for human consumption vastly more than what any other crop had ever had in the history of, of us growing them. Now, what, what's it like just going through the regulatory um, body? Uh, is it, um, what, what hurdles do you have to face to get a GMO from uh, the lab to market? Because this is something I've, I've been hearing the last couple of weeks is that it almost, the impression that I'm getting around the anti-GMO activists is that there is there, there's no regulatory uh, um, hurdles, but that, what well, is it? Let me tell you that What's I like? have never answered this question without somewhere um, a day or two later getting an email from somebody from regulatory saying you left out this step and this step and this step and this step <laughs> because it is really complicated and the people that we have working in regulatory are incredibly detail-oriented people. So the first part of it is we go through all of the R&D just to see, can we do this? Like, can we as a company create this seed that's going to have this trade in it? Let's just keep talking about BT because it's the one where we've been talking about. But um, more than that, the, the um, once we get it done and we know that we can do it, then we start the regulatory process. And in that regulatory process in the United States, we have to talk to the USDA to see, does this crop, is it safe? USDA is the Department of Agriculture, the US Department of Agriculture. Then we have the EPA to say, if we put this crop out into the environment, what does it do? What are the knock-on effects that we see going on out in the world to other insects, to other pollinators, to, to, the, to the soil? And then third, we voluntarily go to the FDA. The FDA in the United States doesn't actually have a purview over, over the, these GMO crops, but we as an organization that say, we know that if anything were to ever happen, we would be liable for it. And so we want to go through all of these regulatory processes. So we start with putting them out in small plots, then growing them out and testing them. We do animal feed studies. And one of the things, Kitch, that we often that I often hear is, you only do 90-day feed studies. What, what, what about the long-term effects, right? You hear this all of the time. And I actually was curious about that myself. So I sat down with a group of, of um, animal feed experts. And they talk about, um, wh what do we scientifically know? How long does it take for... Um, feeding an animal something to show up in its meat or in its milk or in some other thing. And 90 days across many, many animals um, is, is the length of time. Because, you, you know, if you're talking about a, a chicken that's hatched once they get onto corn or pigs in that same way or rat studies, 90 days is enough time. And we know that to be scientifically, there, there's evidence to determine is this going to harm that animal or not. But then on top of that, we have meta studies where it's studies upon studies upon studies of livestock herds that have had mil trillions of corn meals with the, the GMOs in them, and there have been no evidence of harm on any one of them. So in addition to all of the regulatory barriers that we have to get through and all of the animal feed studies, and then also the long-term effects since we've had crops going for BT, or, I'm sorry, GMOs for 20 years, we have a mountain of evidence that people are welcome to look through and to, to see that they are safe for human consumption. Yeah, I'm so glad you while, clarified while that you, about the three months. I'm sorry. Yeah, while, you, while you were uh, talking there, uh, one question that came in was, uh, what else does BT harm? Uh, you were talking about how it, how it harms insects, it doesn't harm humans. Uh, well, I, I guess the, the question is, well, does it hurt anything else? I mean, Fish, anything from like, like soil bacteria, you know, that, that could be an ecological disaster. Uh, I guess that's the question. Uh, do we know that it only harms insects and, and, uh, yeah. So I think the, the, the BT is, is fantastic in the sense that it is incredibly targeted. This is actually a modern marvel 
because it goes after lepidopteran um, insects, which is just one small little group that we know, like the cotton bollworm, for example. There's only a few of the insects that, that this, like, uh, Fred always described it as a lock and key mechanism, right? That the, that the only one that's going to, to get, as far as insects, is a specific lepidopteran. So it is really, really targeted. But then your other question about um, does this BT, if you then breaks down in the soil, you know, does this somehow um, toxify it? And I would say that the evidence says that no, it doesn't. That 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 these crops break down the way that all all, all plants do, and that the insecticidal proteins that are produced within them don't have a negative impact on the soil. But I don't, I don't have studies right offhand to be able to direct you to, but I could certainly find them or, or work with some scientists to find um, th that, how, to, how to explain that maybe more precisely. But does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's just more of a point that it's, it's an, this BT is an example of how biologics um, are becoming, are, are, are inherently more specific for example, if you go to the pharmaceutical companies, you see that the uh, their drugs are the biological uh, production of drugs, antibodies, um, uh, antibiotics. They're very tar they're very tar they're more targeted and less side effects than the small chemical drugs. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Just uh, from a few cents in there. Yep. Yeah, I I'm guessing if there's something that basically causes some some generic uh, chemical reaction then it will affect everything that has to do with those chemicals I guess but but when we're talking about something that affects only a specific gene then it will only affect things that have that gene am I on the right track there yes I mean I don't know that it's specifically to just one gene but the way that that intestinal tract works on that insect is that yeah. that's correct yep okay uh so we're coming up for the last five minutes here and we've got such a huge backlog of questions so we're going to try and nail them quick fire we can go yep yep uh like i said we got such a back if we miss your question apologies um we'll give you the details you can probably answer be happy to answer you on twitter i think would you if, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, I said, like i said we'll apologize but let's try and get through these i think one of the questions was the whole thing relating to the death of the bees uh, i think you've heard about this one so can you What's the quick answer to that? So uh, people have really tried to tie uh, this colony collapse disorder on, onto Monsanto to say that our products or our seeds or, or different aspects of it are harming bees. And the, the first thing that I would say is, as a skeptic's audience, the, the very first thing I would do is look into what is colony collapse disorder and how, how big of a challenge is this to bees. And it is a problem. But I don't think that, I think when you use a term like colony collapse disorder, this brings a lot of emotion in, into the argument. Then the, the other thing that gets tied into that is a, is a product called neonicotinoids, which is a certain type of insecticide that we do not produce. But we do what are called seed coatings. So we'll take a seed and we will apply uh, like a polymer and then spray it onto the seed so that it is you'll sometimes see them as like multicolored uh, seeds. They'll have like a bright coloring on them. And that just indicates that there's um, an insecticide on them, potentially neonicotinoids. And this keeps um, that, that seed from being um, eaten by insects when it's just germinating, when it's just getting started. But there is very little evidence that these things have anything to do with colony collapse disorder. We know that the activists are pushing that, that, that neonicotinoids are, are a big problem and that they should be banned. But the evidence doesn't support that. What the evidence supports so far, and there's still an, a lot not known about this, are um, a, a thing called the Varroa mite, which if you hear this guy named Jerry Hayes, who's our bee expert at Monsanto, he often talks about, you can take your fist and you can put that on your body and that is the size of the parasite that lives on these bees that when they bring them back to the hive and varroa mites spread, that makes them more vulnerable to other types of disease. We think that that has a strong application to it. And that's why we've invested in a company called Biologics, where we're trying to find an RNAi solution to how can you 
uh, kill that varroa mite that's on the bee um, without killing or harming the bees or without having to spray more chemicals into the hives. Um, but this would be another example of by really creating that narrative, you start making people just um, uh, short circuit their, their logical things and just say, well, Monsanto's uh, killing the bees. But because we know that the bees are so important, we've made some pretty serious investments both into biologics, but also into pollinator strategies, trying to figure out how can we ensure that um, the beneficial insects that are a part of an ecosystem are still around. Okay, I would say we're just trying to get through these last ones quick, and I think this one's relating to the whole labeling issue. I'll get out how it was phrased to me. What do you have to say about people's right to know about GMO products, like what food is and is not? You know, I think that um, that right to know, that's such a clever thing. And uh, people like Michael Pollan, when you hear him talk, he'll say, if you frame this as people have a right to know, then if you try and say anything against that, you're taking away someone's right. But the, the interesting thing about um, GMO labeling is that GMOs, if, if, you, if you put that label on, it doesn't actually tell you anything about that product. It doesn't tell you about what chemicals were used to do it. It doesn't tell you about, um, like, for example, if you see a non-GMO label on olive oil or on, um, on, on any type of oil, really, there, are, there is no DNA inside of that oil. There is no way to determine whether or not those were made with GMOs or not. So it's a cynical ploy to be, in my opinion, to be able to make people say, oh, there's something hidden in here that could hurt you. And we want to mandate that label to make people think that there's something worth knowing in it. But Monsanto has said, look, there is no reason that if you're a retailer, you shouldn't be able to put that out there. And if you want to be able to make more money by saying, hey, this doesn't have GMOs on there. So we're, we're fine with voluntary labeling. The thing that we struggle with is that mandatory idea because that will tell people, it will signal to the market that there's something to be afraid of. And so uh, what we have supported is a national standard so you don't have this patchwork of different laws because those laws end up resulting in a lawyer sitting over there saying, ah, I can, I can do a lawsuit here. I can make some money off the fact that somebody didn't quite label this correctly. And instead, what we say is, let's have one uniform standard, and then let's make it voluntary. So any retailer that wants to try and make money off of saying this does not have something in there, they can do that. I think this will kind of finish it off. This person's asked, are you allowed to say anything negative about Monsanto? Because <laughs> I think that's probably the one thing they probably think there's a guy off stage, you know, to the right of your screen there, just waiting. If you s speak at a line, he's going to. I you think with I can see acid. the red dot appearing on your forehead, man. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> the, uh, you know, that's a great question. And when I came into the office, I, I, that was actually one of the things that I had had asked about. Like, what happens if there's some aspect that I don't like um, or that I don't agree with? And the, my, my boss said, there is no question that you can have that we will not sit down in a room and talk through and find out what your problems are and find out what the answer is. And if you go out into public and you want to represent your own personal thoughts about something that are different from Monsanto, we support that. And I think the evidence that, that probably shows this off is I'm sitting and doing a podcast on a Saturday afternoon out of my house representing a Fortune 500 company to trolling with logic, which where <laughs> could I go that the people wouldn't ask me the hardest questions that they could think of and then stick around for the answer and then poke if it looked like I wasn't, I wasn't saying something honest. This is a company that is taking really seriously the fact that consumers have questions and they want to know what's going on with their food and their Monsanto is taking on I think I'm probably the biggest risk in the whole company because <laughs> I'm doing interviews like this and uh, and I'm really proud of that I'm really proud of working for a company that has said go out and answer questions if you get it wrong we're going to come back and correct you um, but but get out there and, and answer as many questions which actually maybe I, I know we're running short on time but where else should I go to answer really tough questions with people that will be willing to stick around and listen to the answers? Where would you suggest I go, specifically? 
That's a tough one. It really is because until you added on the caveat on the end of stick around to hear the answers, I would have <laughs> yeah. said just the end. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. Um, I've seen a lot of daft as it sounds, Reddit's ask me anything. They're incredibly prevalent and you will get some, well, some questions that are just downright vicious, some that are pointed and precise, and some that are just brilliant and like you'll get the vast range from people who know absolutely nothing to people who know enough and hate you to people who are really just curious about the minute details so we did a reddit ama actually fred did one and it was a great experience to, to the degree that uh, you know i don't i don't want to um you know o overrun reddit but would you guys think that would be a good thing to do again to do, do another one try and find maybe like our ctr chief technology officer and and do an ama would that be welcomed by the community you think yeah i think so probably sure. i probably. can't speak for the reddit community because yeah. they're just who can speak nobody can speak for the reddit community <laughs> Yeah, yeah you, you, some, sometimes I f the way I feel about Reddit is you might as well do this on 4chan instead, but... <laughs> <laughs> that I may have trouble uh, convincing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it'd be such an issue with convincing. It'd just be like the cops knocking on your door like, those pictures were posted by someone else? <laughs> I didn't know. I just meant going to Monsanto and being like, so guys, there's this thing called 4chan, and we got to go check it out. <laughs> I guarantee what will happen is you'll have, like, the oldest guy in the room just going, I'm an old fag. I've been there since the start. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I think we'll have to wrap it up there. We've come to the end. We've run over a little bit, but it, it's been fantastic. Um... I'll quickly go around my panel for the final thoughts. Pumpkin, what do you have to say? Um, I, I have learned about magical beer plants that will make me a happy man. <laughs> I've given some brilliant ideas that if I ever see being monetized on, my lawyers will be in touch. <laughs> um, but there's one that Monsanto has has better lawyers than you do. Probably, but you know, mine are angrier. And the only North, question from Northern I'm Ireland as well. So th there's only one thing I really want to ask is you were saying earlier that um Monsanto has nothing against you voicing your opinions if you find a, a bad part of the company. Give us the dirt. The, the coffee in the break room is <laughs> terrible, isn't it? I bet it's terrible. You know, I, I one time stood up, I, I was asked to, to do this thing with um, the HR group, and I was talking about, you know, why you have these amazing computer engineers. They are so focused on the tiny, tiny details. And have you ever drank their coffee? These are people that care about the details. Why are you giving them bad coffee? And like two weeks later, they started getting better coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marty, your final thoughts here. Yeah, I just, I just think it's been really interesting. It's, a, it's a subject that I, th I care a lot about, but I don't know a lot about it. So, so it's always interesting to have someone here to, to talk to about this stuff and the whole gene uh, GMOs and all that stuff. So thanks for coming. And Kitch. Um, it's been really, really interesting. I'll, I'll just echo Marty uh, as well. It's a, it's a topic I care very much about, but it's interesting. But it's interesting to see the corporate side of things and how that translates. I'm only uh, I only know really about kind of the science a little bit. <laughs> um, so and I just want to thank thanks uh, to Vance for for coming out and. Um, giving us a you know great interview. Yeah. And uh, Nathan. Yeah, it was all really interesting. Um, I've uh, I'm fascinated by your job. Uh, I think the job title is not awkward at all. I think it's one of the most awesome sounding job titles I've heard about. <laughs> and I'm um, always I've I've been interested in hearing about. Uh, the challenges in being a PR guy with all the flack that the term PR comes with it and uh, how you overcome that and make it more about science education and uh, transparency than anything else. And so I want to thank you for coming on and giving us a fascinating discussion. Thanks. Okay. And Vance, you've got a, a little platform moment again here.
So I, I think maybe uh, two things that I would like to bring up is one, I, I, last week, you guys, or was it last week on nuclear uh, energy, which was a really fascinating conversation. And it made me think that your audience may find the concept of eco-modernism very interesting. If you go to ecomodernism.org, they talk about nuclear and agricultural intensification. I think that's a very interesting topic. The second thing is, um, in addition to the discover.monsanto that Monsanto has, there's a talk out on YouTube called Graphs Are Feeding the World by a guy named Tim Williamson. It is a fascinating role through how are we using big data to make plants better. And I think that you guys might enjoy that. But if there are any questions that I didn't answer, um, I can be found at, at Vance Crow, and Crow is C-R-O-W-E. And I would love to stay in touch. I would love for people's advice on places to go. And, uh, and you know, the toughest questions that we can answer uh, to the right people, uh, I'd love to do that. Um, so everyone, I think the whole chat room can agree. A very big thanks to Vance and thumbs up if you enjoyed that. Uh, so just to get a few little announcements out of the way, as you can see beneath us, our Patreon is up. So if you're enjoying our content, you can send a few bucks or if you go to our website, you can donate, just make a one-off donation, entirely up to you. But a wee bit of cash would help, kind of, because I'm doing all the editing right now. Because well, <laughs> I don't, I'm not earning. So Cal so, needs his yes, booze. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you, as you can see, all the links down there. You can find us Facebook, through the, uh, the Twitter, and where we're on iTunes and all that. So just to let you know, we're back in two weeks, is it, with uh, CS Prakash? He's going to be joining us. I think you're aware of him. Vance, you? Oh yeah, that'll be a fantastic interview. I don't know what he sounds like. I only follow him on Twitter, so yeah. I have, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, so just to let you, he's the professor of plant genetics, biotech, and genomics at Tuskegee University. I hope I pronounced it. And That's... yeah, and then two weeks after that, we have uh, Concordance on. I think uh, we're all pretty familiar with Concordance, and we'll be talking yeah. to him about uh, health scares and viruses. Yeah. Oh. All good stuff, and I think after that, I think I am finally trying to nail down John Sweeney to come on, who, who I know everyone's been looking forward to speaking to, and we are, he is definitely going to do it, or just, he keeps going off to do his investigative journalism stuff for the BBC all the time, but we're definitely going to have him on at some point. So, Dom yeah, him for keeping up with his career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, again, big thank you, everyone, and thanks for turning out, and... As I say, enjoy the rest of your weekend wherever you are and take care. It's hip to be a hipster. Cool to be a hipster. Shit if you're not hipster. So hip to be a hipster.